Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland and Public Square. I'm Rick Jackson, senior host and producer at IdeaStream Public Media. We are again for the fourth time in a row live in Public Square, also known as Cleveland's largest transit hub. And we can think of no better place to host the topic of today's conversation and our final forum here in the City Club and Public Square series. This one's called Where We're Headed and How to Get There by Transit, the Future of the Greater Cleveland RTA. Good cue, it drives right by on time. Public transit plays an essential role in ensuring all residents have the freedom to get where they need to go. Jobs, medical appointments, grocery stores, school. Public transit is also a solution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in highly congested urban areas. Yet less than 2% of our state budget goes to public transit. Many experts believe that is certainly not enough. Public transit also faces the added challenges of limited multimodal options, which offer safe pedestrian routes and protected bike lanes for transit riders. Last month, the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority launched Next Gen RTA. It introduced changes to many routes. They increased the frequency of some bus services. They reduced wait times and increased the number of one seat rides. This reduces the need for bus transfers. So joining me on stage to talk about all of this, India L. Birdsong, General Manager and CEO at the Greater Cleveland RTA, the organization's first female CEO. Welcome. India is no stranger to urban life and public transit. She grew up on the near west side of Chicago before attending high school just outside of Boston. For college, India attended Temple University, I don't have a Philadelphia accent, and returned home to pursue a master's degree in urban planning and policy at the University of Illinois, Chicago. India comes to Greater Cleveland from Nashville, where she served as Chief Operating Officer of WeGo Public Transit. That's the Regional Transportation Authority there. Before Nashville, India spent nine years with the Chicago Transit Authority. So please, put your hands together. Join me in welcoming India Birdsong to our City Club Forum today. Thank you. Hands and cheers. You're popular. I'll help you with the, the Philly accent. Okay. You'll have a chance to send in questions yourselves later this hour. If you're watching this virtually, text those to 330-541-5794. We will curate them and add them to the conversation we're having here at Public Square. Now, Ms. Birdsong and I were talking earlier about transit in general and how Cleveland is always looking at the next piece of economic development. She said to me that transit is economic development. I want you to explain that for people. How is transit economic development? Well, Rick, thank you for, for having me here, and thank you for everybody for taking the time out of your, your afternoon and, and the cheers. Uh, go RTA. I see a lot of the faces out there. So they're doing a lot of hard work, and just want to say thank you to that. Um, economic development, it absolutely is transit. Um, just being able to think about accessibility and how we move people through the city is imperative to every day coming to work. Um, we actually have talked about and actually done the work of changing our mission statement. Um, we typically had a very technical mission statement, which is great, and it's something that we want to be able to continue. We want to bring you safe transportation. We want to be on time. We want to be reliable. We want to be friendly. But those are the things that we have to do to provide good service. They're not necessarily the reason why we come to work. Um, connecting the community is what our new mission statement is. It's really simple. In fact, it, it was so simple we even argued right behind closed doors about whether or not it was too simple. Uh, but we really wanted to just be very point blank with the community. Um, being able to be an economic driver is accessibility. So I, I do have a, a background, as you mentioned, in community development. Part of that is economic development and bringing the dollars to the city so that we actually can get to a place of equity is something that I think public transit has a niche market, right? We can corner that market, but we don't normally do that. We typically just traditionally make sure the bus goes down the road, make sure you hear the little ding, ding, ding of the trolley, and then we go home. But that's not enough. We need to be able to actually be part of the fabric of the community. We need to bring dollars back to Cleveland. We need to make it not one of the, the, the lowest income areas in the, in the nation. We need to make it the reverse of that. Um, when I first came here, and I've not been here two years yet, right? And I think three quarters of that time has been pandemic. So you want to reverse that, maybe I'm six months in. Um, but I saw the amazing kind of infrastructure that Cleveland has. And it was the Carnegie you know, era. It was the Rockefeller era. How do we get back to that? We have good bones. And part of that is investment, and, and that's the economic part of transit I think we need to be able to focus in on. Let me go right where you started, the idea of you being here 
nobody expected what happened to us in 2020. The pandemic obviously had a huge financial impact on the Greater Cleveland RTA. Are we back to where you would want to be now? Uh, no. We're, 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 and I think if you ask me that, even if we, we are 100% funded and we have all the routes in the world, my answer will be no. Um, I think that we can't be satisfied with where we are, but we're getting there. Um, just the fact that I can talk to you not shielded behind a mask uh, indicates that we're, we're getting past the stage of panic. But we never are past the precipice. We always want to make sure that we're on guard, we're ready to go, and we have uh, you know plan A, B, and C. Um, I do think that public transit um, is, is in the infancy stages, right? It's kind of re-merging itself. And I think that we have to be able to have plan A, B, and C. We have a pretty aggressive uh, strategic plan. We have a 10-year strategic plan that has a lot of promises in there. And I think we got to start doing the legwork now in order to actually realize those things. I'm a planner by trade, and I've written plenty of documents that get put on the shelf. And you dust them off in 10 years, and you say, check the box, we did it. Um, but that's not, that's not successful. So we have to be able to get there. Since we've dove into money early, let's just go ahead and go there. The state has done very few favors for public transit. Ohio House Committee had to overhaul the governor's new budget bill after a plan to slash public transportation drastically to $7 million. Restoration, though, that $70 million isn't for RTA. That $70 million is for the entire state of Ohio. I would contend even a restoration of the old levels doesn't give you a whole lot of leeway to make wholesale changes, wholesale improvements. What do you have to do to convince Columbus that these things matter? we have to get butts in the seat, right? And, and I don't want to be too crass when I say that, but we have to be able to get the confidence of the Clevelanders, of the greater Clevelanders region, and, and really Ohio, to be able to show that we're essential. I think the pandemic, absolutely, if there were any fear about whether or not we were an essential service, we absolutely know it now. Um, the state has typically given um, lower dollars when you look at our state versus others. And I think it comes out in the programs that we're able to put on. But we also have to be fiscally responsible with the dollars we have. So we've got to be transparent about what we're doing with it. We have to be able to talk about return on investment. And I always say we have to be able to kind of operate like a private company in the public sector. Um, I would imagine that if I want to go out for a referendum, right, if, if the RTA board decides that that's something we want to do at some point in time, uh, we have to be able to prove to Cleveland and the state that your dollars are worth the time, your dollars are worth the competition that comes out, uh, will be on the ballot right against your um, EMS, against your teachers, against your, your police and fire. We have to be able to show that we show up every day and your dollars are worth the investment for public transit. Otherwise, we're going to be in a continual sort of fight every year and not be able to plan out projects past 12 months, which we know is realistic. While the state didn't give you all the money that you would like to have, the pandemic funds from Washington certainly will be a help. How do those get used? What's that do? Or did it just supply us back to where we needed to be? Where, where's the money go? Sure. So, Rick, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of people will uh, look at the, the coffers we have now and say, you guys are flush with cash. You can do anything you want. Um, I would say, yes, we are in a good position. We're in the black. Uh, we're getting to be in the black, right? We're not crying broke right now. Uh, but the funding from PERSA and all of these kind of American Rescue Act funds has allowed us to be able to plan for the future. We actually can look at, first of all, making sure that we are disinfecting buses and trains as we should. We actually looked at the New York model. Uh, I, I, we said, hey, take a look at the ones, the big dogs, right? What are they doing and why can't Cleveland do that or better? Um, we have temperature testing. We have things like the, the mobile vaccination bus that's sitting behind me. Um, we actually have started to invest in ourselves, uh, paying down debt. Uh, that's defeasance. It's a huge investment. It's not the sexiest conversation to have, but it allows us to be in a situation where we're not owing uh, on, on you know scores of bonds in the future. We can kind of pay down that debt now and then be able to work towards the future. We also are paying down on capital projects. We had a $500 million deficit um, where we needed to be able to work on capital projects. So if you go to a rail station and you say, okay, this needs to be upgraded, that's a capital project. Uh, if you look at your bridges and overpasses and they need, they're need they crumbling, that's a capital project. Uh, we need to also be able to buy um, our vehicles in a manner that is safe for our uh, constituents and our people that are riding. You do not want to be on a bus and a train that's past its useful life. 
So those are the kind of things we're doing um, to be able to make sure we're in the in the black, and then also making sure we don't have any layoffs and no furloughs. We have not done that at all for the pandemic. You just mentioned the idea of vehicles that are past their useful life. Uh, Greater Cleveland RTA recently canceled a rail car procurement request, hoping to reissue it in a couple of months, I gather. But only one operator submitted a proposal for consideration. You guys decided that was not what you needed to do. Where are we with that, and how far can we go if we can't get new cars, new buses? So, good question. So we did have a procurement that was out on the street for the rail cars. I know that uh, a lot of you in the audience have uh, written uh, the health line, you've written our buses, but you probably also written the train. Um, our current infrastructure and rail car itself um, are past useful life. So we wanted to be able to get going with that procurement. It typically takes a few years to get through it. Uh, buying a train and, and buying a bus, uh, it's not like buying a pair of shoes, right? You've got to wait a while. How many cars do we want to buy? So we will put out the initial procurement uh, somewhere in the area of 18 to 24 cars. We want to get closer to the, the area of 34. Um, we did put our bid out there. We put our uh, procurement packaging out there, but the responses we got weren't enough. Uh, we want to be able to bring quality vendors, quality cars to Cleveland, and we felt that it just didn't hit the mark. So we're actually uh, retooling it, uh, making sure it's out there long enough, making sure that the specifications are, are spot on, uh, you've got to remember, we haven't bought rail cars in upwards of 35, 40 years. So this is a skill set which everyone doesn't have. It's not easy to do. Um, we want to make sure that they're easily translatable. And we actually are going to uh, put that back out probably in another month and a half or so. And then we expect to be able to get our responses back in in the spring or, or before so that we can actually go to our board with a recommendation uh, by the middle of up, or the end of next summer. Interesting, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago you want to watch what the big dogs do and try and follow them. I've been on public transit in both New York and Washington earlier this year. At the time, I didn't know I'd be doing this with you, but I do know that their cars seemed nicer. Is it important that we do step up in ways that the public can see, not just the ways of infrastructure that are behind the scenes? Yes, I, I think it's absolutely important that we do things that people can see on a day-to-day -day basis. I know that you can give me uh, the best in the world but if it doesn't taste good I don't care what seasoning you use and what truffle oil you put on there I'm not buying it so it's the same thing with public transit you've got to be able to feel safe it goes back to those original tenants we talked about that should be automatic uh, we should not be pat on the back for being on time that's something we should just automatically do uh, so the same thing goes with buying the rail cars um, to your point uh, they seem nicer they're probably younger they're they're not as old uh, I think we have one of the oldest fleets in the country I did come here from Nashville, uh, who might have actually beat Cleveland by a couple of years as far as their rail fleet. They have commuter rail, and we want refurbished cars. Uh, Cleveland is past the point of buying refurbished. We need brand new. When we talk about the things people do see, let's talk next gen. Big uh, flashy rollout last month. A lot of people got free rides out of that just to kind of reintroduce them to the RTA. How many Merry of you Christmas. did that? Some of you jumped on, yeah. Um, how adaptable are these the systems and the routes and even the drivers to the constant tweaking it's going to have to do to keep things running the times you want you shorten the times wait times you know you've made a lot of changes that are substantive is there always tweaking involved um, so i am a planner by trade it's a very uh specific and arduous process to be able to tweak the system um, if you change a minute here you got to make it up there um, you've got to also pay for it. Every second has a cost to it. Um, our team uh, actually was very, we took painstakingly kind of uh, effort to be able to adjust and tweak. I think that generally uh, most people that ride will say that they have a better experience in less transfer. So what does that mean? You can get to where you're going more often on a one seat ride. Um, you don't have to necessarily transfer two and three times in order to get to your end destination. It will happen, but it shouldn't be as often. Another thing is duplication of routes. A lot of times we have things that have just been in play for years just because uh, we haven't looked at it. I'd like to be able to think that we can make these adjustments when we're in the black and not when we have to slash service because we don't have any money. Um, the best time I think when you can do things is when you have time to think about it and the pandemic actually allowed us to do that because our ridership was down and because we could kind of step back, 
take a look at what we have out on the street and try to make it work better with the least amount of friction for our riders. And, you know, everyone's not happy, but at the end of the day, I think we did a pretty good job. Uh, follow that for me. The idea of six weeks in, what responses are you hearing? You just said everybody's not happy. Are there people who are happy? Uh, yes, I think by and large, uh, the majority of folks that we hear from are pretty happy with it. Uh, we have never, to my knowledge, done a, uh, a service redesign at RTA. If not, it's been over 40 years, probably through the CTS days. Um, so we actually are looking at um, a pretty happy ridership, which is you know, just good. You're trying to hold on to that. Uh, we do have a couple of folks that uh, would like to have their previous route restored. Uh, what we're trying to do is be able to communicate through the council to those uh, members of the community to understand that your route may be relabeled, it may be renamed, it doesn't mean you don't have service. We just have to get used to some of the changes, but you still should be able to get where you're going. If, it's, if you're not, then let us know and, and we'll look at it again. Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority provides transportation services for about 150,000 to 200,000 customers on a typical weekday. Where would you like to be in terms of rides provided? That, that comes to like 45 million a year, something like that. Where would you like to see RTA go? As far as ridership? As far as ridership. Um, I'd like us to be able to be in the 80 to 90% range. That, that's ideal, right? Typically when you look at ridership and you're in the 60s and 70 percentages, you got a lot of work to do. Uh, with the pandemic, we've actually gone down to 50% of our normal ridership numbers. So we've got to be able to get to a slow crawl. So I would imagine if we can be able to bump that probably 10% uh, at least every six to eight months or even on an annual basis, then we're, we're trending toward the right direction. And when we do look at our numbers, uh, we're doing that. I think we were up around 11% uh, this time this year versus this time last year. So year over year, we're, we're getting back into the swing of things. Let's talk diversity, equity, and inclusion. Buzzwords of the era we live in. Is the system right now as all-inclusive as you would like it to be. Uh, when you say system, uh, what exactly are we doing? Um, well, it's two part question. One, sure. are we serving people everywhere equitably? And two, I wanted to look at the board of directors. So we are, we're getting there. So I'll answer it in two parts if I can. So if I start with the board of directors, uh, we actually have a, uh, a board that is pretty diverse when it comes to experience uh, and not just your typical, you know, black, white, male, female kind of, kind of issue. When you're talking about diversity, I really like to think about it as an all-inclusive sort of uh, a question. So ability or disability, um, perceived that is. Uh, when you're looking at male, female, gender uh, identification, when you're looking at race, nationality, you're looking at experience as well as tenure, time on the board, private versus public. I think we have a pretty good uh, kind of smattering of that now. Uh, we have a 10-member board. We have a, a brand new uh, president, new not to the board, but new to the seat. Uh, our president, Reverend Lucas, is very uh, a huge proponent of pu our public transit and specifically paratransit. Uh, because he is an avid uh, rider of that, he is wheelchair bound, uh, and he has a really good idea of what's needed because he takes it. And I don't think you could ask for a better advocate in that regard. We do have uh, members of the private sector. We have a brand new member, uh, Roberta Duarte, who is a, an avid writer, and she she definitely is, is in tune with- You get a lot of praise for putting her on the board. I, I can't take credit for that, but uh, <laughs> we appreciate her being there. And I think that uh, the conversations about diversity are, are coming up more regularly, and I appreciate that. Um, I always say that if the board wanted the same, they wouldn't have hired me. Um, so I think just my hire alone hopefully signals to the community that we, we need something a little different and we're going to do that. Um, as far as I, our diversity in-house, um, we are working to that as well. We actually just got an award through uh, Greater Cleveland Partnership for Best in Class. Uh, I asked our, our Director of Business Development, well what does that mean? Are we the best of the worst or are we just the best of the best? And I think it came down to we're, we're the best of what we've got, and we've got more work to do, but we're doing a pretty good job of um, actually making sure that we're equitable and accessible. Um, when it comes to our stations, I know this is a little long-winded, I wanna make sure that uh, equity is there when it comes to how to get around the system. So we're working toward that, we're not there quite yet, but that comes to where shelters are, where um, you know, uh, bike or bike and bus only, first mile, last mile, uh, we have a ways to go, but we're getting there. You mentioned Roberta, she came on the board 
as one of your other members stepped away, who's now running for mayor, which makes me wonder, of the seven people who want to be sitting down there in a couple of months, have you talked to all of them? Are there some that you see are very favorable to where RTA wants to go? Are there some you're afraid of? Um, I would say that out of those seven, I'll work with whoever is in the seat. Uh, and I know that's a, a pretty- You don't get a choice on that. No, absolutely. I will work with whoever it is. But I have had conversations with a few of them. Uh, we're actually setting up conversations with some of the folks I have not talked to yet. I have looked at some of the um, kind of Skype and Zoom uh, Q&As for the candidates. And when public transit is, is asked, my ears perk up. So I think that we're lumped in with the conversation about sustainability, and that makes sense. Um, what I do notice is that uh, the, the board member you mentioned uh, who's running, he has a little bit of, of that insider view because of the board activity. But generally, I think the candidates have an idea that public transit is important. Um, I am here and our team is here in order to be subject matter experts to make sure we can guide them in the right, the right way. So I think from that standpoint, they're all a pretty equal as far as their, their outsider knowledge, but how we can help them with the insider knowledge, I think will make all the difference. And so many topics I could choose from. I think some of them will get to part of it. So let me ask you about regionalism. You're starting talks with NOACA, but we see contiguous systems, Summit, Lorraine, Portage, Lake. Are talks starting to happen with them about ways we can cooperate to make all of the systems stronger? Uh, there is. I think there's a lot of conversations now. If you look in the strategic plan, uh, regionalism is a, a continually topic of discussion. I don't know if we're comfortable uh, yet because we don't know what it will look like, but there are a lot of conversations about things like fare collection. Are we going to be able to have it uh, kind of a, a, a one-stop shop where you could hop on a Lake Tran vehicle, you could hop on an RTA vehicle and pay one time? Um, I do think that that's something we absolutely need to look into. Um, RTA is actually at a point where everything is meeting its useful life, right? You hear me saying that a lot. And that's affording us an opportunity to look at new fare collection systems. So that's something we're going to do. Um, taking advantage of the technology is something I think we have uh, probably about 10 years to catch up on. And I want to be able to do that within one or two years. So in order for us to be aggressive that way, uh, we've actually uh, taken a look at adding um, an innovation and technology uh, kind of revamp. So we have brought on a new deputy general manager, Mark Pettit, he's in the audience there. Um, and he's actually looking at how to revamp the IT department from the administrative side and fair collection is part of that. I had a listener call me with a question before we even got started out here today. Wanted to know about your thoughts on service animals. Said they knew of complaints from people who felt like the policy wasn't clear. Uh, there were times where drivers didn't let an animal on. What is the policy for people who have to use the service animals in a public space that's only 70 feet long? Sure, so that's, that's a good one. Uh, service animals typically comes up uh, in every city I've been in. And uh, having worked in operations myself, I know that it can be comfortable and uncomfortable for uh, different members of the riding public. Uh, generally, you have to be able to have a uh, service animal uh, that is there to, to help you along the way. It is a, uh, it's tied to a medical sort of condition. It's not anything where you bring your pet on board. So we want to respect that right of the customer. Uh, we typically don't ask. Um, there are certain rules around being able, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, if there is an animal that is not trained, that is not uh, vested. Vested, muzzled. Right. Well, muzzled? no, okay. no, not necessarily. But, but vested. Correct. Uh, some sort of um, marker, indicator, that they are there to be able to help that passenger on. Uh, typically, you might see lap dogs, you might see different kind of animals. Uh, folks, I think, are misguided when they feel that it's a particular kind of look that you have to have. Uh, but we allow that. You also may be accompanied by uh, a personal care attendant, and there are rules to that as well. But we have very strict guidelines on what we can allow and how we treat those individuals. So if you do have an issue, definitely let us know and we'll correct it. Before we get to the audience questions, you mentioned mission statements, new mission and vision statements to roll out. What does that mean to system users? And you said it's only three words. But what do you want that to mean to system users? I want it to be simple. I, I don't want it to be so complicated that you can't recite it. Um, I want you to understand exactly what that means, what we're there for, so that you can hold us accountable. Accountability is absolutely important. If we don't know why we're at work, then, then what are we doing all day? Um, the mission statement should be bigger than the bus and the train. We impact so many people's lives on a daily basis. 
Um, if you can't make your doctor's appointment, that's a huge issue. If you can't get to your child care provider on time, there is a penalty for that. If you can't get to work on time because of us, that might be your rent or your mortgage payment. So we're bigger than just pushing the vehicle down the road, and I wanted it to be able to uh, convey that in our mission statement as well. Thank you. Take a break. Today we are enjoying our final forum in this summer City Club and Public Square series talking about the future of the Greater Cleveland RTA. Joining me here on the stage, India L. Birdsong, General Manager and CEO of the Greater Cleveland RTA. We are now beginning our audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, and that's whether you're joining us via the live stream or here at Public Square. If you have a question in the square here, please form a line behind this microphone. It's designated right up front. Our staff members are standing there. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club. You can also text those questions, 330-541-5794. Again, that's 330-541-5794. Staff will try and work it into the program here for me. But we want to remind you, your question should be brief to the point so we can get to as many as possible. And please make it a question, something that ends with a question mark. So can we have the first question, please? We're gonna start with a um, Google text question. I'm a new employee at RTA and have heard from a lot of operators and mechanics about why they love their job. I want to hear about yours, India. Is there a particular project, initiative, or even issue you want to address that keeps you excited about your position? That's a really good one. I'd, I'd like to know who that was, but I won't ask. <laughs> so, Too many people are laughing. I can't yeah, tell Yeah, there's somebody out there. I'll find out. <laughs> so that's a really good question. Um, I think I'm excited about um, our diversity initiative. I think our, our DEI, we actually have a part of our webpage on our internal page, we're gonna roll it out externally pretty soon, that really gets to the conversations, the hard conversations about are we are we hitting the mark? You know, you asked me about that before. Let's look at our vendors, let's look at you know how we treat our employees, let's look at the ridership. Um, I look a lot like the folks that drive our buses. I look a lot like the folks that may be cleaning them up. And because of that, um, I'm proud of that. And I think when I talk to people when I come into Cleveland, a lot of times they mistake me for a bus driver. And because of that, um, I get to hear the real raw sort of uh, feeling about RTA. And sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes it's, it's great. Depends on who you're talking to. So I think that being able to kind of get that awareness out there of how important RTA is and how respected those bus operators and those mechanics have to be is really important. And we've got to start that from the top down and the bottom up at the same time. So it might sound a little cliche, but I'm excited about sort of talking about cultural awareness, talking about these programs, not being afraid to go out into the community. Um, and we do a great job at it. We just have to be able to kind of sound the alarm a little bit louder. You started this conversation talking pride of staff. And I think a lot of people don't know just how big the RTA is. You also said there wouldn't be layoffs. How many people work for you? So you're looking, uh, there are about, about 2,300 employees, give or take. Um, and I'd say about 80, 75% of that is uh, kind of field employees, what I call it. So out in the, the uh, districts where you've got your rail operators and your mechanics and your engineers and that kind of thing. And you've got maybe about 350 or so administrative staff. Um, it's a huge animal, but uh, it's not the biggest in the industry and it's not the smallest. We're kind of in that sweet spot but it takes a lot to be able to make sure we communicate with each other. Um, you know, uh, Wendy Talley is in the audience, I see her here, and we talk through a lot of our workforce development every day, our, our HR, George Fields is out there somewhere is why I saw him. Just being able to talk through how we communicate with people and how we really bring the humanistic side of it uh, is really important. We can do a lot of good things. Uh, we have a, a new chief of uh, transit police, uh, Deidre Jones, she's there in uniform to my right. And just being able to go out, they did a lot of good work, the Diversion Center. If you logged on to our board meeting this morning, you saw us being able to report on that. Um, just being able to kind of clean up the community as well, I think we're ambassadors for the program that we have. Every day, you are on. RTA does not allow you to be on call. You just are automatically on. Doesn't matter if you're in a uniform or not, you're a representation of the city of Cleveland, and I think we've gotta be able to work to making that a little bit more respected and a little bit more professional. We do it in-house, we've gotta be able to get folks to understand that on the exterior as well. And you're aware, post-pandemic, of course, as we try and become more of a tourist destination once again, those people really do represent Cleveland to the rest of the country. Absolutely, they're, they're ambassadors. Um, I, I like to say, 
Special events tend to follow me. Uh, the draft was in Nashville, it was here as well. Uh, pandemic aside, people sent in all kind of kudos or complaints or whatever it was, typically kudos, to say, hey, you guys did a great job. You know, we again, I hate to throw the names out there, but I want people to understand the people behind the work. Uh, Dr. Flante Cave, I'm looking directly at him in the back, he's our COO and he's over operations. He took it seriously. Um, and I think that the team actually followed suit, right? So you've got to be able to be an ambassador for the work that you do because we deal with the public. Everybody doesn't have a great day every day, but we receive it nonetheless. And if we can do that in a graceful manner, then I think we've, we've fulfilled our bill. Thank you. Next question. Yes, I just I understand that your materials have been submitted to Global Cleveland for translation into a variety of languages to make your service more acceptable. Tell me what languages those are. So we actually started the conversation. That's a good question, sir. Global Cleveland, I was introduced to them, uh, I want to say maybe about six months ago. And uh, I asked them a question and said, well, what are the, the prevalent kind of languages that are in Cleveland? And I think the answer, of course, you've got, you've got your typical English and Spanish. You normally have those in, in your translation kind of guidelines. Every city, right. Right. And then you've also got to look at, um, is it Croatian? Is there a Serbian kind of uh, aspect to it? Are you looking at Portuguese? I'm just throwing languages out there to give you an example. Um, we will follow their lead on what they feel a good recommendation for language translation services are. Um, if you've ever heard of anything called the language line, there are kind of like a ESL services in most tra public transit. Um, the problem is it takes too long for translation and people give up. So we wanted to be able to kind of stay ahead of the game and translate things early so that folks would be able to ask questions and be prepared when they get to our station. Should we start thinking about multilingual signage? Certainly Terminal Tower. Sure, that's something I think that uh, came out of some of our experiences in trying to market the next gen. Uh, we realized halfway through that we needed to be able to have those services kind of translated. So I think going forward, you'll be able to see a lot of that happening where you hadn't before. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey there. Um, Good to see you, Bird Song. It's it's good to see you. Um, I'm in love with this COVID vaccine bus right now. So well, for those who, like, who can't see, there's a COVID vaccine <laughs> bus directly behind the stage here. Yeah. Uh, so I think it does a great job of talking about showing and illustrating why transit is essential in our communities, and more than you said, just in the commutes, but in, in connecting us. Um, my uh, question is actually about what's going on at the federal level. We know it's really, really busy right now, um, but something that was concerning uh, was a line from Rob Portman last week. Um, he was saying essentially that, oh, if, if we can't come to a deal on transit, we just can leave it out. And I'm just curious if, if your team has, has talked to his office, um, I'm especially hopeful, as, as well as the Senator Brown's office, and um, you know, just being able to help push back on some of that. I know is doing a big uh, e-action alert today and wondering if our team might be sharing that. Um, but just, yeah, what has that been like for you? So, really good question. First, thanks on the bus. Uh, I'm excited about that too. Um, as far as going to the, the federal level and just kind of explaining what the importance is, um, I've, I've met with Rob Portman, um, sat in his office uh, in DC, and had kind of a one-on-one -on -one with explaining exactly how important transit is to the economy. I do think that there's a lot of education, there's room for that, um, but we can't just leave anything. We've gotta always make sure that it's on the table. And I think that he understands that, that transportation is important. We've just gotta figure out how to fund it. And when we look at the differences, when you're looking, especially at the state level and beyond, uh, we're competing against highways. We're competing against trucking. Um, you know, There's a lot of rural communities who may not necessarily have the level of transit as a Cleveland and may not see the immediate benefit in it. So it becomes a rural versus urban sort of conversation at some point, and you gotta be able to split the dollars. Uh, Cleveland is kind of the, the, the big dog in the room as far as Ohio goes, and we've got the oldest infrastructure, so we typically need the most dollars in order to keep things up and to repair. Um, but I think, again, if we can come at it from a privatized sort of mentality and look at it as a service, um, where it, it's an economic driver, um, also, the contracts that we uh, are actually engaging in to be able to do these capital projects, we're providing jobs to a lot of the constituents that you know report up to, to Senator Portman and the like. So we're actually helping to boost the community, and if we can prove that argument, then I think we have a better shot at, at explaining how important we are. 
reminder, you can tweet your questions to at the City Club. Matt has done just that, asking you, does Greater Cleveland RTA have plans to expand real estate investments and transit-oriented development beyond West 25th to Shaker Square, Public Square, or other transit hubs? So good question. I actually was uh, meeting with our real estate manager yesterday. Good timing. And good timing. And we were talking about that very thing. Um, so the answer, the short answer is yes, we have uh, sites on transit-oriented development. Uh, right now, we are the owners of a lot of untapped land. Uh, some of it is kind of odd in, in shape and, you know, trying to figure out exactly what to do with it, you know, trying not to turn everything into a parking lot. Um, but we have to think about how we connect to the next mode, I believe. So if we have an opportunity to be able to talk about the first mile, last mile conversation, what happens when you get off of the bus and your end destination is a mile and a half or two miles down the road? How do we actually connect to e-bike? How do we connect to scooter? How do we connect to the, you know, the Ubers and the Lyfts, you know, pre-pandemic to be able to get people to that next destination? Um, it's not always ending with RTA, but we may have an ability to make people comfortable in those areas while they wait for their next mode of transit. So I think that all connects back to the fare collection that we talked about before, that all connects back to uh, being able to utilize our real estate power and being able to kind of wield that to connect communities themselves. So we will be looking at uh, different ways of being able to kind of capitalize on those real estate ventures and then move transportation forward. Thanks for the question, Matt. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, Amtrak, we're moving to the um, Tower City uh, Rapid Transit Station. So as far as the, the Tower City, we are tenants of it. We, we definitely are there in physicality. Um, but those conversations, uh, we're not necessarily always in the room when it comes to what happens with uh, Amtrak. That is a different area there. But we will be able to continue to be updated on that. Um, Tower City is an interesting sort of animal where it converges a lot of different businesses and it's, it's the nucleus of the city. So we'll definitely be involved in those conversations, but I can't come on, comment on that right now. We are one of the few places where you see light rail and heavy rail kind of interplay the way that they do here. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for interconnectivity um, to be able to make sure that even in the rail car, for example, that we're going to purchase. It, we're looking for a car that can flip between modes. Um, so to speak, so that we don't have two and three and four different kinds of specs. It drives our engineering folks crazy and our maintenance folks nuts as well. We want to be able to, to do things in a simplistic way, which allows us for longer and more efficient sort of uh, service. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. See you for time. Thanks good for doing you. this, you too. Um, just before I get to my questions, I wanted to acknowledge the memory of George Seller, who passed away earlier this year, and uh, thank him for uh, his uh, passionate advocacy for public transportation. Um, my two questions are very practical in nature. One is about the E-Line. Rick Jackson and I were just talking a few weeks ago. on the stage talking about that, yeah. Yes, we were. So I'm wondering what's the status of the E-Line, the latest on that. And then the second uh, question is you alluded to earlier about RTA's involvement in real estate. I know that you want to do no RTA for buses and rapid, which is great. But RTA is very involved in bridge uh, maintenance as well. So I was wondering, if you could talk about other fiscal responsibilities that RTA has that people don't necessarily think about um, that you all are still responsible for uh, for building or maintaining. Well. Oh, absolutely. So I'll start with the real estate. Um, the real estate, again, it seems like it's a hot topic, and I can understand why. Um, we have a lot more than just rail and bus. We've got uh, legal department. We've got human resources. We've got workforce development, accounting. Uh, engineering, uh, urban planning, there's a lot of different disciplines. And when you talk about what it takes to be able to operate the bus and the train uh, with the stations and the maintenance facilities, I mean, we've got buildings that are as big as football fields. In order to make sure that we maintain those areas, um, we enter into a lot of memorandums of understanding, MOUs, we have a lot of contracts as well. Um, so just what goes into the maintenance of real estate is not just having, you know, signing off on the, the dotted line and saying, I own this. We've actually got to maintain it. Um, I think what we're starting to do now is take inventory of what we're actively able to maintain and what we actively might be able to lease off, what we might be able to get uh, residual income coming in from uh, areas that we maybe don't fully occupy. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to be able to think about the maintenance part of it and make sure that it's a, a safe and sound investment. Um, when it comes to our, our services, uh, I think that that's also 
part of the conversation. We want to make sure that we can maintain things in a way that makes us proud to be able to put them out on the street. If we've got a vehicle that's beyond its useful life and is no longer uh, serviceable, we need to look at how we can either refurbish that, uh, sell it off if, that, if applicable, or put it in a contingency fleet where we bring it out every now and then and it can be babied a little bit. Those are, are some of the things we can do. We have to be creative in how we think about our financing so that we actually can respect the dollars that you guys give us every day to hop on the service. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, in 2007, RTA hired 30 fair enforcement officers, yet since Late 2017, uh, RTA has not performed uh, proof of payment fair enforcement uh, anywhere in its system. Uh, so today, RTA still employs those 30 fair enforcement officers, costing the agency $1.8 billion in armed fair enforcement of its fair regulations. When will RTA adopt a civilian transit ambassador program? This will uh, reinstitute outdoor boarding, uh, could be instituted throughout the entire system, reducing boarding times by up to 20%. And before you answer, explain to folks what exactly those folks do who are fair enforcement. Perfect. Um, you read my mind, Rick, and thank you, sir, for the question. Um, the fair enforcement question has been one that precedes my time here, but it's, it's something that definitely is, is on the table. Um, talking about whether or not one feels comfortable in proving their fare when, once they're aboard is something that is, is of importance. The officers that we have uh, that previously kind of operated in that arena for fare enforcement actually do a lot more than just that. Um, so we actually have reallocated their job responsibilities and duties uh, to make sure that they protect uh, the RTA as far as the customers go, as far as responding to uh, incidents that may happen at our stations, that may happen aboard our buses, investigations. Uh, we always you know, get things, there's Amber Alerts that come up all the time, there's BOLOs. When you look at making sure that the system is safe, that's what those officers are, are primary in doing. Fair enforcement is actually a very small fraction of what those officers are tasked with doing. Um, however, the idea of transit ambassadors, I've heard that quite a bit, uh, we're actually looking into that and, and haven't made any determination as of yet. However, I do believe that that's a priority for our chief uh, to be able to get out there in the community and make sure that people understand that we're here to help them, not to intimidate or harass them. Um, so that's something that we definitely are looking into and we'll come back to the community on, on 